So someone asked me this morning, who is the whore that rides the beast of Revelation 17, of the apocalypse of St. John, the Revelator? And now, this is a complicated question, but I'm going to try to tackle it in a nutshell. I'm going to have to skip over some parts, but before I even get to reading, uh, I'm either going to read Revelation 17, or maybe I'll just play the Alexander Scorby uh, audio of it uh, to save you from hearing my voice reading the whole chapter. Uh, I think that's what I'll do at the end of this video. But before I even get to John the Revelator, and even crack open, I've already got it cracked open, Revelation 17 here. But before we begin to read that, I think it's important uh, to have in focus the symbolism that John was using in this passage. And I think that there, it's very clear to me, I'm a student of mythology. I uh, was a competitive uh, student of mythology in junior classical league when I was in secondary school. I placed uh, number two in the state of Missouri, uh, num number three one year, and number two the next year, and I was within one point of placing number one that year, and it was the girl that I had trained my junior year in who, who I, I helped her study. We studied together, and she beat me by one point in the state of Missouri in junior classical league in the mythology test, knowledge test. That was many years ago, but I'm just trying to underscore the fact that there, I have very few actual areas of expertise, and I'm not saying I'm an expert on mythology, but I'm in the ballpark, okay, w without knowing uh, a lot of Latin and not knowing a lot of Greek. I can read Greek out loud, but I still have quite a bit of knowledge, at least of Greco-Roman mythology. Now, that brings me to this symbolism of the whore that rides the beast. And we can't really understand <clears throat> the symbolic uh, interpretations of John, and I won't go through all of them. I'm going to give you mine. But before we even get there, we need to know the mythological significance, because all of John's uh, audience, all of his uh, readers in the Greco-Roman, in the Roman world, which was a Hellenized, in many ways, a, the educational system and the pantheon, the gods worshipped by the Romans, were the Hellenic gods with a Roman spin. So uh, Zeus is of, of the Greeks, becomes Jupiter, and Hera, his wife, becomes Juno, and uh, Mars in the Roman pantheon was Ares in the Greeks. So you go on and on and on, Venus and Aphrodite. Now, this comes right down to modern days, because the continent that we call Europe, which is not really physically distinct, you know, there's no, there's no physical barrier between Europe and Asia. They're really all one landmass. But the continent that we know as Europe takes its name from a Greek myth, the Rape of Europa. So the name of the continent is named after a woman, Europa. Uh, Ovid, who died during the reign of Augustus Caesar in biblical times, when, when Jesus was a teenager, uh, his most famous text today, he was a, he was a Latin a Roman author, but his most famous text is the uh, more than slightly pornographic Metamorphoses, chronicling from a Roman perspective in Latin, I believe it was written in Latin, could have been written in Greek, but anyway, Ovid was a Roman, and he wrote the Metamorphoses chronicling the pantheon, the Greek pantheon from a Roman perspective uh, for a Roman and Greco-Roman audience. And I'm not necessarily recommending the book. If you study classical literature, you definitely need to read it. I'm rereading it now. I, mean, I started a few months ago. I've almost finished it, but I... I uh, have been focusing on getting through it. It's difficult to get through because of the amorality of it. There is morality within it, but um, it's so raunchy. It's so the stories of the Greco-Roman pantheon and their gods and Pan and Zeus and Hera, uh, Jupiter and Juno. They're they're so raunchy and so. Uh, sexually promiscuous and so much betrayal that you really get a taste. If you really want to get a taste of what the Bible's talking about when the prophets say, the people that lived in darkness have seen a great light. Okay? When the gospel came to the Greco-Roman world through Paul and his 
the pe successors, those people were living in darkness. Okay, they were living in darkness, and there's connections between the uh, uh, different uh, Asian and Oriental gods like Baal and these, but I don't have time to go into all that. Suffice it to say, Europa, the story of the rape of Europa, and you can see it in Ovid's Metamorphoses, is the story, the mythological uh, root of the uh, origin of the European peoples. And according to this Greek myth, and according to Ovid, it began with a rape. Europe and the Europeans began with the rape of a human woman by a god, namely Jupiter, or Zeus, the so-called king of the gods, husband to Hera. Now, Ovid and the Greco-Roman pantheon have, unlike the Jews, the, uh, the value of monogamy. They were monogamous cultures. They were not tolerant of polygamy. They gave an exception, according to Josephus, to Herod and to the Jewish kingdoms to, to have uh, more than one wife because the Bible allowed it. But the Greeks and the Romans were monogamous. And so, uh, but they were monogamous, but their gods and they themselves were constantly committing fornication, constantly running out on their wives, constantly committing any numbers of abominations. And they, uh, anyway, the, the stories of Zeus and Jupiter are replete with him trying to hide his consorts, sometimes uh, other goddesses, sometimes nymphs, which are pseudo uh, goddesses, sometimes human women, like the mother of Hercules. And in this case, Europa was a human woman, a, a virgin girl. And to say the story in a nutshell, she was there by the, sea, the seashore, by the side of the sea. She didn't know how to swim. She was a young girl. And Zeus often approached the women he wanted to rape in the, uh, excuse me, in the form of an animal. So it goes beyond even uh, you know, whoremongering <clears throat> and sex and pornography into into outright bestiality. These are the people that were, you know, the gods that were being worshipped by the Greeks and the Romans, engaging in bestiality. So Je Zeus, in the case of Europa, approaches Europa in the form of a very large beast, namely a bull, but a very beautiful bull, one that you would look at and say, "Wow, that's a that's like a a, 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 a thoroughbred," you know. I guess that's the word you use for horses, but a, but a very uh, keenly bred bull. And Ovid says the bull was very beautiful, and Europa looked at it, and it looked very gentle, and it allowed Europa to approach it, because it was really Zeus seducing her uh, in order to rape her. And uh, she approached the bull. It was very beautiful, and she reached out and petted, and it was very gentle, and she touched it, and she put her arm around the bull's neck, and it kneeled down and let her climb on its back like a docile animal. So she just climbed up on the bull's back, and the bull stood up and gently walked with her along the seashore, walking a little ways out into the sea, into the ocean. Eventually, as she's petting the bull, she's enjoying uh, befriending this animal. Now, she didn't realize that the bull had begun to walk very deep. And now when she realized the water is all around her, and the ocean is all around her, she didn't know how to swim. She couldn't swim, and, and she was afraid now to jump off the bull because she was afraid of drowning. And so, as the story goes, the uh, bull, which is Zeus in the form of an animal, begins to swim, and he swims toward, you guessed it, what we now call Europe. And so, I won't go beyond there uh, for the sake of um, decency, but let's just say that... Uh, once they got to Europe, the the bull copulated with uh, Europa, and it was not consensual. And it's not clear whether Zeus transformed into a human form, and I don't think he did, actually. So we're led to believe that the um, origin of Europe and the Europeans begins with an act of bestiality by the so-called god of gods and king of kings, Zeus. So that is the mythological symbolism behind the whore that rides the beast in uh, Romans uh, Revelation, Apocalypse of St. John, chapter 17. And all of his audience would have been familiar with it. John did not invent this imagery, and so before we go forward in interpreting this imagery, 
um, it's good to have in focus that that this was imagery that that was already you know ha had been Ovid had it was ancient imagery already from the Greeks already hundreds and hundreds of years old but Ovid had re in the past few decades uh, from when John was writing had already reminded the entire world of it through his uh, immensely widespread metamorphoses again you can go read metamorphoses he doesn't go all the way to the rape part but the rape wa of Europa was part of the myth that he told he told about the abduction so John is clearly utilizing the imagery of Europa and the rape of Europa but in John's case she's not being raped okay He's still using the imagery, but she's very consensual because he calls her, 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 her copulation with the beast and her relationship with the beast is consensual because he calls her the whore. And obviously, um, there's no fair sense in which you can call a, a girl who's been raped, being raped a whore, uh, except in a very technical sense. I, I would never use that sense. Or in an Islamic sense, perhaps. I'm not familiar with Sharia law. But anyway, um, this whore that rides the beast of Revelation 17 is consenting to the relationship with the beast and utilizing it to be um, drunk on the blood of the saints. So I'm not going to give uh, the, you know, I'm going to give my own interpretation of Revelation 17. And I'll give the full text from Alexander Scorby in audio after this video. But I'll quote from it during this video. You can read Revelation 17 yourself in your own Bible. I'm reading from King James Bible. I don't trust many other. I'm not, you know, religiously King James only, but I don't trust NIV for sure. I don't trust their editorial board, and I don't trust many other English translations. Uh, and I'm familiar. I learned to read out of the King James Version, so I'm using it. So, um, in a nutshell, so that this video doesn't run too long, uh, my position is that the whore of Babylon, the whore that rides the beast, is first and foremost, okay, not Europa is the imagery, but first and foremost in John, it's the Jews who uh, denied the Lord Jesus Christ, who, the ones who did not repent at the preaching of Peter in Acts, the ones who failed to repent and instead began to persecute the apostles and the disciples of Christ and the evangelists and the Christians. Because uh, the imagery implies adultery, which is a theme over and over and over visited by the uh, prophets of the Bible, and especially of the Old Testament, and always, always, always used to refer to covenant people who have betrayed their covenant. Never before in the Bible is uh, the imagery of a whore or an adulteress or a harlot being used uh, for Gentiles. So my position is that without going into detail, the kings, the seven heads, the ten horns, the beast himself is the Greco-Roman Empire. Okay, the Hellenized Roman Empire and their Caesars and the whore the whore that rides that beast of secular government is the people who were supposed to be the covenant people of God, but betrayed God, remember, at the cross? Before the crucifixion, at the betrayal of Jesus, uh, not the betrayal by Judas, but at the betrayal of Jesus by his people, when they said, give us Barabbas in the Gospels, and they said, we have, uh, uh, Pontius Pilate said, y y do you want me to crucify your king? And they responded by saying, we have no king but Caesar. Let his blood be on us, and up, up upon our children's heads. There's the adultery. There's the whore. The uh, unveiling of the whore occurs at that moment. The whore that rode the beast. As you go through the traditions that we have about how the apostles and many of the early Christians were killed, they were killed many times by Romans, but the first people who, in, and also sometimes directly by the Jews, uh, but even many of the Roman killings similar to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, were instigated, according to tr tradition, and, le and it's more than legend, a Christian tradition, but they were instigated, sometimes at the hands of the Jews directly, and sometimes at the hands of the Romans, uh, egged on by Jewish uh, influence and lies. So, uh, my first, number one interpretation is that the whore, the beast is the Greco-Roman secular government. Okay, and it's symbolic for secular government throughout all ages and all times. Yes, I want to look at the historical approach first, but I think we have 
a solid application for today. Okay, just but it's important, just like with the mythological context, to after that, once you get the symbolism in focus, get the historical, immediate historical interpretation in focus. That's a rule of hermeneutics. Okay, especially when it comes to eschatology. Don't jump to your any possible uh, contemporary application or over-spiritualized application until you identify the immediate historical context. Then you can go forward if there is a forward to go into. So I'm saying, number one, it's the Jews betraying uh, the Christians who were at that time still considered to be a sect of Jews to the, betraying them to the Roman authorities. That's why they're drunk on the blood of the saints. So you can go through, um, I'm not going to read it again, go through one by one by one and, uh, and make the correlations to Rome and to the Jews. Now, the problem verse, uh, the biggest problem verse that I have in, Re in Revelation 17 with my own interpretation is verse 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The problem with that is that Rome is the city that was reigning over the kings of the earth at that time. Caesar had the title, God of Gods, King of Kings. Nonetheless, I remain solid in taking the position that um, Rome is not the whore because, okay, first because Rome is the beast that the whore is riding representing secular government. And they, you can even go through uh, from the preterist point of view, and I am a partial preterist, I'm not a full preterist, but according to the historic Christian tradition, the early, uh, many of the early church fathers, I think most of them were to some degree partial preterists. Certainly John Chrysostom and even the reformers, Luther and Calvin, would have, would have been partial preterists. That is the uh, consensus ancient Christian tradition. There were others, but I think that's the mainstream tradition. So that's what I am, uh, partial preterist, meaning that there is a fulfillment of these things in the first century, but they're not all completely fulfilled. Uh, there also is a fulfillment of some of these prophecies in the future. So uh, when, you, when you have that in focus, you see that the whore is distinct from the beast. She's riding the beast. She has a relationship with him. And I would contend that from a spiritual perspective, because Jerusalem and Judea, even though they were a far outpost of the Roman uh, Empire, because they had many exceptional characteristics, namely they had the emperor worship exemption. They're the only province that didn't have to worship the empire until that exemption was revoked upon their rebellion. But the Judeans and the Jews specifically had many special privileges. And the degree to which they were able to influence uh, the Romans, even to persecute the early Christians, demonstrates uh, the level of influence that they had. There were many within the Roman Empire who were drawn to the monotheism of the Jews. Many citizens were... Uh, Jews or Jewish, uh, like, like, like Paul, and if not physical uh, blood Jews, uh, uh, actually descended from uh, Israel, they, there were many proselytes among the Roman citizens. So there was a, a special status of, the, of Jerusalem. And also because of the architecture of Herod the Great and, and the... Um, uh, uh, the special status that he had in favor with the emperor. But on top of all that, there is a special spiritual status in which Jerusalem reigned even over Rome. Okay, I'm taking the position that they reigned even over Rome because of their monotheism placed them in a higher spiritual category. So even though the Romans were their rulers, they were able to manipulate the Romans the way you saw Pontius Pilate being manipulated by them but not only Pontius Pilate, they were able to manipulate Caesar himself to a certain degree because of their superior theological uh, constructs, because of their superior theology, their superior, uh, let me say, even intellect, okay? Not that the Romans were unintelligent or stupid, but they were in many ways manipulated by the Jews. That's why the Jews had a... Um, 
emperor worship exemption. The way we see today, um, do I dare even say this, but the way we see today um, Jewish people rising to the top of many uh, profess professions, including the uh, medical profession and government and the kind of manipulation that the uh, Israelis today exercise over the American government, for example, uh, I believe the Jews in the Roman Empire were exercising that similar kind of manipula uh, manipulation and coercion over Rome and Romans leading right up to their rebellion, which culminated in them losing all their privileges and losing Jerusalem and losing, losing the temple. But that's a different story. Uh, now, again, 17 alludes to the um, the beast, the, some of the horns of the beast getting tired, getting fed up with the whore and destroying her. Again, that uh, leads us to believe that um, the whore is not uh, Rome herself, but is a manipulative prostitute who had a relationship with Ro Rome, which she leveraged to kill the saints, namely the Christians, her sworn enemies, because she had rejected Christ. So I am explaining away Revelation 17, verse 18, by alluding to the fact that from a spiritual perspective, Jerusalem was uh, actually, um, you know, a greater city than Rome. Greater in, in good, because Jesus was from there. From a positive perspective, greater, because God himself was uh, born in Judea and crucified in Jerusalem. And um, so he came, God himself incarnate from the Bible's perspective came out of Jerusalem. And also from a negative perspective, because Satan himself entered Judas Iscariot and the betrayal of God and the crucifixion of God in the person of Jesus Christ occurred at Jerusalem. Jerusalem, uh, as Jesus said, there's no prophet who cannot be killed in Jerusalem. That's a paraphrase. But so Jerusalem and the Jews are the whore, first and foremost. Now, having said that, and by Jews, I don't mean the ethnic Jews. I mean the Jews from the Gospel of John, where the differentiation occurs between the ethnicity of Jewishness and Judaism as defined by the rejection of the Messiah at Golgotha, at Calgary. We will have, we have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. Okay, they crucified God. They crucified God. They crucified Logos. So, now, let me offend some more people. Primarily, for me. Okay, that's the primary, primary historical application. For me now, yes, it still applies to the Zionists and the Christian Zionists, who I no longer call Christians. I no longer consider them to be uh, Christians because they've, they've compromised Christianity. I mean, they're further from Christianity than, than Islam in spirit, okay? I'm talking to you, Christian Zionists. So yes, they are also uh, extensions of, you Christian Zionists are also extensions of the whore that rides the beast. But I would go further and say that at any time, and in any age, any Christian who betrays the word of God and doesn't repent, okay, doesn't repent, and puts the priorities of secular government, whether it's Greece or Rome or any other secular government as symbolized by the Greco-Roman Empire, whether it's the USSR in the last century, in the 20th century, or whether it's Washington, D.C., or Tel Aviv today, anyone who puts the priorities of a secular government above the gospel of Jesus Christ, his great commission, or the law of God, is part of the spiritual whore that rides the beast. The beast is secular government. The whore is those covenant people of God, Jewish or Christian, okay, who claim a covenant with God and pretend to be the queen of heaven, <laughs> and the queen of all the earth, spiritually, all right? But they're just like the, the, the go read the prophet Nahum. They're just like the, 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 uh, the whores of Old Testament prophets. They think they're big stuff. They think they're beautiful. They think they're wonderful. They're ugly. They stink. And if they don't repent, just like the Jezebel of Revelation and the Jezebel of Elijah's day, God's going to kill them. Their days 
are numbered. And their days of persecuting the saints, of persecuting the people of God, are numbered. Get that, Christian Zionists. Get that, Zionist Jews. And get that, Christians who betray your brethren and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God uh, because of your allegiance to secular government. You better repent now. Your day of reckoning is coming. If you don't believe me, go read Josephus, Wars of the Jews or the Jewish War by Josephus and see how they suffered. You have a part to share with them. Think about those Jewish warriors, the last band up at Masada, who slit their own throats, killed their own women and children. Think about the people in the siege of Jerusalem who ate their own children. That's right, they ate their own children. You Christians, especially professing Christians, who are throwing away the gospel and trampling underfoot the, the cross of Jesus Christ for your uh, eschatolog eschatological, uh, scatological <clears throat> fantasies. You go read what Josephus had to say. He was an eyewitness. He wasn't, wasn't any Christian, but he was an eyewitness of how miserably they suffered. You think God has changed? You've got another thing coming. So that's the whore that rides the beast. And like Judas Iscariot, her life does not end joyfully or in a good way. It ends like Jezebel, very ugly, very ugly, at the hand of an avenging God. Chapter 17 And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-coloured beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, 
and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth.